Uh, my name is Don Brower, and I'm at the uh, University of Notre Dame and then the Very Family Center for Digital Scholarship. And I'm going to present how we organized and ran some student annotation projects last year. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge uh, my colleagues who were collaborators on this. It was a team effort, in particular, uh, Peter Cornwell of Data Futures, Natalie Myers and Julie Vecchio, both from Notre Dame, and Eric Decker at the University of Basel. All of them contributed to making this successful. So um, over the last three semesters, we ran seven annotation projects overall. Some of these projects uh, we, were, we were planning a, some of these projects for a while, but they were all prioritized in response to our institution's COVID-related stay-at-home orders. Um, we all suddenly, like all uh, our library student workers and also student workers from elsewhere on campus needed a way to work remotely so they you could get paid for their work-study positions. And these projects helped fit the bill, and they also provided some useful scholarship. So we, uh, we focused on what we call structural annotations. These are the kind of things that help others or, or help you find your way through a pile of images or to locate things that are useful for further analysis. It's like some examples would be like finding chapter headings or locating diagrams or identifying map legends and so on. You know, sometimes even marking page numbers can be useful. Um, and our projects ranged over a variety of corpora. We had the epistemological letters, which were kind of 1970s physics philosophy zine in a way. Um, we had some Vietnam government newsletters from the 1950s, a medium-sized map collection. And then we had finally the East Asian treaties, which had like tens of thousands of pages of scan text. So each of these projects, we collected different types of metadata. And we and two of them have had their results pushed into custom and Vimeo repositories for um, access. So, all right. So to kind of set the stage, just kind of what the just so we have something in concrete and think of. Um, this is kind of what the annotation viewer looks like. Like we have, we're using Mirador two, um, and we have like the image in the middle with annotation tools in the upper corner, and then. Uh, we have these workflow links in the bottom left, and that's actually, I'll talk more about the workflow later. So that's actually a key thing. Okay, and then here's, here's what an annotation would look like. Um, in this case, we're identifying a, a title of a map. So in this, in this annotation, we had some metadata, which is a transcription of the title. And then we also had, we're classifying the page, the page type. So in this collection, like there are road maps. So we were trying to pull those out, for example. Okay, and then here's another example of annotation. This is from the physics zines, if you will. We were identifying equations, so. Okay, so um, let, me, uh, let me start, just go over the technology really fast. Uh, we, we, the technology is standard and as simple as possible. Um, all the items being annotated were stored as image resources on the IIIF server. Uh, we kept the annotations in a separate database, kind of a standoff uh, annotations. Um, we used ORCIDs to identify the annotators and for, to, to sign in. And then we used um, Mirador 2 instances, custom one for each task, because we had to adjust the, the metadata collection. And then we used the uh, Data Futures Anna Store service to actually be like the workflow server, track each unit of work and, and who was working on it and whether it was finished and then in some other workflow things. So um, people overall, we had many students, undergraduate and graduate um, express interest. We also had some people, some library faculty and staff and some other people like some, I think a high school student signed up. In the, we had about 19 annotators from at least two different institutions and they made more than 10,000 annotations over the three semesters. Um, and this subset probably were like the super annotators and they seem to do like the majority, probably at least around two thirds of the annotations. Okay, so the, with that many people, um, we needed the, one, of the, one of the two big things we had to do was keep, keep everyone organized. So to do that, we, uh, we made a LibGuide page and use that as the home base. All the links and documents were put there, organized by project. We also put links to uh, the sign-in page and the other websites on there. We um, used a mailing list for communication. 
Uh, we try to keep um, regular communication on it. So like weekly, weekly ish status updates. And then we wanted annotators to know that there are people here who are actually helping support them because they can get lonely. So we uh, encourage them to contact us with questions and we also held virtual office hours. And I guess for some people they preferred spoken or hands-on examples. So. so probably the training was the uh, one of the harder things. Our workers were at many different levels of ability and they could come and go as needed um, or as they desired. To address this, we had a few strategies. First, each distinct task had a document describing how to do the task, complete with screenshots and examples of what to do and what not to do. Sometimes it got, we went, we went into extreme detail just to make sure people would do things as uh, in a consistent way. We chose annotation tasks that did not require expert knowledge, and we tried to give clear guidelines of what we expected and then and try to eliminate as many judgment calls as there, as there could be. And then we also encourage annotators to ask us, reach out to us with any questions they might have. Um, they were going through, you know, especially in the treaties, thousands of pages, there are situations that we didn't expect, like fonts would change or, or the typography or the way things were organized would change. So we, would, we often would have to um, address special situations. And then in those cases, we would go back and update the task documents with, and, and maybe even have QA, uh, um, some FAQs and adjust those. So um, for the most part, we didn't have too many problems with, with QA. Um, some projects didn't have much of a QA process. Maybe the project curator would spot annotations. For others, there, there was much more extensive, the project curator and maybe even with an assistant would do much more review, possibly looking at everything. Um, if we notice systematic problems, we would update, again, we go back, update the task documents. And, um, and often this would be like, like a case where we had a subtle ambiguity or there was an easy way to misinterpret something in some other way. So we would, we would fix that. And then we would send notes in the mailing list um, to clarify what we noticed and address ambiguities. Often students are very conscientious about quality and some of them went back and fixed their annotations after, after we pointed out some of these problems. So um, let's see, moving on. So these are kind of example of a kind of what the raw annotations would look like at the end. Like we have here, like we're looking at from the treaties, we have like a canvas identifier, the, the annotation on the page. And then we also have like the metadata, in this case, a, um, the transcription of the text, a date, and then the annotator who, who made that. So here's another example of some annotation. In this case, we, we pulled out the, these titles along with their, their sequence numbers. This is like a two-dimensional sequence number. Okay, so the other problem we had besides organization was just kind of keeping the work moving. Uh, we needed, the annotators could really chew through a lot of the work, especially, especially when, we had, when, we, when we had a lot working at the same time. Uh, so this was a constant immediate concern to find more work. This is probably the biggest challenge. Some, um, some of the smaller projects, uh, the annotators could work through in like in a few days to a week. I mean, the larger projects were months, so that was nice. But uh, we we wanted work that was useful and not just work for work's sake. So we actually we actually tried to find things that were um, well tuned to annotations, especially the structural annotation, and and things where where we already had source images ready or almost ready for annotation. We did not want to have to go through a digitization project first. Um, and then once we did that, we we assigned a, like a curator or someone who or internally who would who would be like be the person responsible for the research side of the thing. They would define the goal and they would figure out what metadata would be useful. And then we would work with them to figure out um, what we need to collect. Sometimes this would be actually a research PI. Sometimes it would just be a, like a domain expert who understood the material. Um, let's see here. Um, and then when we chose the task breakdowns, um, I, so we, you know, again, we chose things that, that, that we did not require expert knowledge or, or a judgment. Um, the most important thing here was that we actually then broke things down into work units. We tried to identify, um, we want anteriors to be able to finish a work unit in, in like, like five to 10 minutes was kind of the rough idea. Um, so usually this would be a single page or a packet of pages. So we would make like a sub manifest for just, just a few things. And then our workflow, the Anastore service 
would then give the, an the annotator that work unit, they would work through it and then they would click next. So that would kind of cement that and then it would mark that work unit as finished. Um, this was a good way to get a lot of people to working in parallel without duplicating effort on these corpus. So, all right. So now um, I like to, like, so that was kind of the hows of what we did. And, and um, I'm gonna discuss some thoughts about how well the whole thing worked out. So, okay. So um, it turned out using ORCID was uh, actually a very good idea. Um, it, <laughs> we could handle people from different institutions and we did have um, a few different institutions. We also had, like I said, a high school student. So we had people who didn't have any institution and no problem. And we and additionally, we had, we had, now we have a scholarly identifier, persistent identifier for the person. So we can, we, we associate that with the annotation. So that way when they get reused, we have a, we can cite everyone who contributed to it, to them. Um, it also provided a teaching moment for students. They could learn what ORCIDs are. Uh, and then we also, um, it's been so, it was actually pretty useful. And we've used ORCIDs as a science method, method for other digital projects we've been working on. Um, we were very lucky to have, we were already had a prior relationship with Data Futures and this Anastore platform that was the key piece that let us um, have, have all this work, have everyone work in parallel and without duplicating effort. As I said, that was very, that was very important. Um, we, we, we met our goal of providing useful remote work for our student workers. That was, um, that was probably one of the most important driving things for getting this done. Um, this is like this is like a year ago. Very, uh, and then on top of that, we also this also was a good moment for in the library. We could show other people in the library what annotations were and how they were useful, and and let and then and and then um, um, we tend to actually offer this as like an internal service to, to other people. And in fact, we have a few projects already lined up just from showing people what we've been doing. So, all right. So now going through the, the some problems that we were, it was. The first problem was um, it's just it was challenging to find enough work to keep people busy, because one of our tasks was to provide useful useful work, remote work. That was that was a, a important criteria. That may that may um, that's just just challenging because it takes a long time to develop projects. Um, now that the immediate need is gone because we've been kind of going back to on-site work, this that that may this is not such a big deal, but that was definitely a problem at the time. Um, uh, let's see, the, the technology infrastructure works great once it's set up, but it was getting a set of uh, effort. It felt like we were, sometimes it felt like we were dealing with just slightly more complexity than we could grasp. And then dealing with all of the servers and identifiers and things um, was just, yeah, it was just a lot. Um, in addition, one of the things that that we would, I, I, I would like to see personally is, is more, um, is more things involving like discovery or access to annotations. Like we can we can view the annotations today. I mean, and we have and we can access to them. Of course, we can also just pull them out of the database because we have because it supports a, a WADM um, API. But we also but I wanted uh, it'd be nice to see a better discovery or exhibit platforms for these kind of annotations. And then um, for next time, um, well. I like to see is or for our next projects, which we which we do intend to keep these going, is uh, definitely focus on community. Um, ideally, I, I think that's continue this. Uh, people let people know how, like get into the subject of what they're doing, and also because um, they're going to be going through all the images anyway, they should like at least have an idea of how it's going to be useful and how and how they're contributing to research, um, bring answers to research questions. Um, I also work on the better way of tracking progress. This might even be like a slight gamification type process, maybe like a leaderboard. I'm not sure, but I think I think have giving more feedback as um, as far as like what has been done versus and how much is left that could be good for people. And then also another one is uh, we definitely working on getting better like checklists um, in place new projects and then and developing a vocabulary for describing what the annotation workflow would be so that way we can use the same descriptions um, from like from everyone from like the the curator to to the developer so because I guess yeah it's that because it seems like a lot of times we're just re-explaining what we want but in different terms because everyone uses a different vocabulary so all right so this is uh, my presentation I guess I can 
I can, we're done a little, a little early, so we could possibly go to um, see if there's any questions. I'm not sure. So, yeah, thank you. Um, that's a really lovely uh, reflection on, yeah, kind of a nice project that got quickly driven by some, some urgent needs. Um, there are a couple of uh, questions here. Um, I'll ask the first one, uh, which is just asking how much work did it take to customize the Mirador annotation form? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not the developer who did that, so I, I don't know. But I think at this point, it is it is it is um, it's a, it is routine, but it still needs some effort. So I think um, this was done by a developer at Data Fusion. They they have like about thirty projects or so. Usually, we get a turnaround in like in like a day or two, depending on their other workload. So. But no, that's a good question. In fact, I, I think a lot of these things, when I look at it, I, I keep thinking, it seems like there should be more, like it should be easier to do something. So this is definitely something that I would like to spend some more time on, so. Great. Um, and, and another question is just asking if you can give an example of a complex annotation scenario. Okay, um, so not sure, <laughs> not sure how I'm gonna interpret the word complex there. Um, I guess I suppose one situation could be um, we have like, we have complexity. I guess in terms of the amount of different types of metadata you, you would collect, um, we have we have a few things where we did we did collect um, like we, we for the for the Vietnam newsletters we collected the table of contents, which among other things we had we had they had people just trans because there was like they were like typewritten in a bad font OCR didn't work so well. We had people transcribe them. And we had to mark the inter the page number in the table of contents in like in bold, so that way we could machine process it out later. Like right? we could keep track of that. So um, I'm not really sure how else to track what a complex annotation would be. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, it looks like I can see the questions. Um, sure. So I, I'm gonna move on to the next one here. Um, sure. So so question is. Uh, is Great to see good examples of crowdsourcing, including paid. Any more insights and tips to share about your experience? Um, yes, this is actually a very, very good thing, and it was very. And I think, I think them being paid was was good for many reasons. For um, it was good for them because they're definitely spending hour like, time on this. But it's also good as an incentive to actually get people to actually work on it. Like we noticed, we have, we have noticed a drop off uh, this last this last. April, as people started coming back on campus, the number of annotators was going was going down. So, um, I I do think that going forward, like we will want to keep we want to keep like a paid element, or at least have people like um, who will work on this. And that was a good thing. I like I definitely like the crowdsourcing. It's kind of fun being bringing people in. As as you know, the challenge is making sure everything's a low, same common denominator. Um, another thing that we were looking at that we didn't do was trying was. Like because for annotations, annotations have been great. Uh, another thing we're looking at possibly using is using a, something like Zooniverse for things that aren't quite the level of annotation complexity. But um, I, but you no, know, it's been great. But like I said, the biggest thing is is I would do with crowdsourcing is communication, making sure everyone feels like they're like they're part of something bigger. So that's that's wonderful. Um, I'm I'm afraid I'm gonna I'm gonna call it there. Um, but that's the great news is that we you know you we can kind of keep. Um, that chat going in the Whova platform, and if you're willing to answer the questions that are there. Um, but for now, so we can start the next session, I'm going to say a big thank you. Um, thank you to Don for, for this presentation and, and provoking a lot of those good questions. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, yeah, and we hope uh, we'll hope you see it at future sessions later this week. Thanks so much.